Welcome back to Powered by People. Kicking off episode two of this series, we're thrilled to have Peter Grouse joining us. Peter is the CFO at Fourth Line, the go-to compliance company for banking, fintech, insurance, and beyond. He bowed as group CFO at Bitpanda, head of strategy at OMV, and held various leadership roles in strategy and operations consulting at PwC. Today, he joins the Red Card CEO, Harry Bigwood, and Director of Brand Experience, Ben Leeson, to talk about the CFO and TA connection. Welcome back to another episode of Powered by People, a podcast that discusses, I don't know what we discuss, we discuss everything, but mostly people in business. Um, today we are joined by uh, Peter Kraus Gruber, and uh, that was said quite well. With a yeah, very good. Uh, and uh, <laughs> and uh, Benjamin Stephen Leeson, um, whose name is actually Ben, isn't it? Cert- yeah, birth certificate Ben. Um, and today the topic is the CF, the CFO, and the TA connection. We had so many people on here from the world of talent acquisition and people as a as a more general topic. Um, budgets and, and budget constraints and all these types of uh, uh, questions come up are relating to where these budgets come from and how they're operated, particularly when it comes to people in business. And this is the guy that has all the answers. So <laughs> yeah, it helps. It helps. <laughs> we're um, we're going to get started on that couple of topics over over the course of the episode: uh, collaboration and communication. Looking at how. The finance team, as a general, uh, as a general topic, collaborate and communicate with people, HR, talent acquisition, and then alignment and shared goals, and how they ultimately should be if they aren't already driving the business to the objectives that are set out at a more holistic level. Right. Before we get into that, we're going to do some quick fire questions. Quick fire. Um, so first and foremost, Peter, how do you start your day? Oh, that's an interesting one. Yep. Yeah, but it's also an easy one to answer because basically uh, it's probably my two and a half years old son that wakes me up in the morning. I have an exact. So yeah, that, no, no, uh, it. that makes yeah. it easy for me to Did get up. They start <laughs> earlier than you plan as well. Well, actually, I don't need a battery uh, more <laughs> to wake up. I mean, basically, he does the job, right? <laughs> which is good. Which is good to be honest. I set my alarm for an. It seems to be I set my alarm for an hour before she does. Yeah. So my daughter wakes me up at least an hour before I eat. Absolutely. Yeah. It's the same with me still. And uh, <laughs> but to be honest, it's it's great to to wake up with the family and yeah, get the start the day started. Normally, what I do then immediately is uh, prepare breakfast because he's always immediately hungry in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> so before I have the chance to do anything, the the breakfast right. self or whatever breakfast. Nice. Three down to the breakfast, then I make it for him, and yeah, and then the usual routine is going to start. Good. Ben, how's your day start? Very similar. I mean, we're probably all in the same boat, right? <laughs> yeah. Just do that. Yeah. Might have to go away to go at the same time. You know, do any exercise or how do you get prepared for your day? I, I, I don't. <laughs> I mean, okay, far, that's what you do. Yeah. I, I think it's, a, it's it's the same, right? I think um, when you have kids, you're you're no longer in control of your day. Like your day is um, completely beholden to them and how they start it. And I think your your mood for the day is also very dependent on, what, on the, how they wake up. Times they woke up the, the night before. Absolutely. Um, I usually start my day with two hours of meditation. I then do 1,000 sit ups. I then go for a 17 mile run. But you could see that. Right? Yeah, that's obvious. You know, and I feel great at that point. <laughs> what? So I get back. Usually everyone's still asleep. So I'm joking. Um, tea or coffee? Oh, absolutely tea. I never drink milk at all. Uh, no milk, nothing. Black tea. Black tea. Legend. Um, favorite social media platform? Zero. You're not a social media guy, are you? Uh, not, not too much, in fact. But uh, to be honest, I, I don't know if LinkedIn is, you call LinkedIn a social media. Yeah, uh, it is. I think it is now. Yeah. Then, it, then it's LinkedIn from the rest. Yeah. Of the well, <laughs> um, are you on any other platforms? Well, yeah, yes. I have a Facebook account, but uh, my Instagram. I'm sure you're right. Uh, <laughs> if, if you... <laughs> no, I shouldn't have said that, right? <laughs> and a MySpace, apparently. If you wasn't a CFO, what would you be? Oh man, that's an interesting one. I mean, if I would go just a few years behind, uh, uh, yeah, then I would probably be uh, still a head of strategy or something similar. But yeah, like that a lot. I'm a strategy. If you could go back twenty years, uh, have you had any yeah. sort of uh, 
changes in your career where you're like, do you know what? I'd love to have done that. Yeah, I think initially when I thought about what to study, I was actually signing up as well for industrial design. I'm pretty, I, I still believe, I forget where it's objective. I'm Not pretty okay to find stuff. Yeah that, yeah, that type of things because my, my my dad is also an artist and I really like I like this stuff a lot. So uh, perhaps that would be perhaps the other the other nice. Yeah, could be an option. There's always a chance to change career, Peter. <laughs> um, and how do you want unwind after a busy week? A good question. First, I really have to say I I, I like to uh, just uh, do my workout and and get a bit of time off from that. So I for, for me fitness and, and gym and whatever. Yeah. How often time do you work out? Uh, not enough, of course. But uh, probably. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna as I guess it more than. <laughs> if you get once, that's more than yeah. If you did twenty minutes, well, it's probably twice or three times a week. But yeah, it depends also on your intensity. It, and to be honest, family, in fact, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. the weekend, uh, doing something with the family, that's how you can basically unwind uh, from it. So. What depends. <laughs> you haven't met my wife. And you have uh, choice in face, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right, so that's Peter. Um, we're now getting into the, the hardcore topics of the yeah. CFO and the TA connection. Um, so first and foremost, we, we sort of started talking about this uh, just now. Um, and the... We... We sort of initially had a, an, a bit of an epiphany moment that the TA team is always involved in budgeted decisions. Um, when we're talking about, so you've got different, you've got different types of budget, right? Yeah. Headcount. Yeah. Um, and how you're budgeting that. And then you've also got, when we look at talent acquisition, what budget would they, do they have to actually achieve the headcount? So tell us a little bit about your, your sort of experience and process in that, in that sense. Yeah, I definitely can do that. And I'm, I want to say it straight away. I'm pro I'm not sure if I do everything perfect there, but I think one main assumption should be there, and it's uh, budgeting itself needs a very very strong collaboration between two areas, and that's yeah. finance and HR. To be honest, yep. To be straight straight uh, to the point here, which means um, we also need to connect to each other uh, when the two things I'm responsible for the financial uh, aspects and the people area needs to take care about how those. Does those, uh, do those things fit together? That means how many FTEs do we hire, of course, which, which profiles do we need? Because uh, this is where it links to uh, down to TA. Because, I mean, um, identifying and getting the right profiles is most important, right? Yeah. Yeah, I don't care much if I spend $2 million on 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 a... Yeah. <laughs> well, there I do. But, but, <laughs> but um, how, how the money is actually being spent... Mm -hmm. uh, because in the end, we need to get the best return on investment, and that means hire the best talent for the exact situation that we have, right? And I think this is where we need to talk about. Yep. And I mean, it's not what I can judge alone uh, alone about it. This is what um, the management team together mm. needs to decide. Okay, these are the budgetary constraints in terms of financials. Yeah. How do we, so to say, make the most out of them? Mm -hmm. And this is where we need to stick heads together. What I'm trying to do is, and it's changed a bit from what I've done pre previous in my career, in the scale-up environment, in the fast-moving environment, you basically try to do that on a quarterly basis at least, right? You, yeah. you iterate, you check where you stand, etc. Right now, to be honest, actually, a real-life example, we invite our head of talent um, probably every two to four weeks to the management meeting and discuss the roles, talk about priorities, which profiles we want to hunt, uh, I was abroad recently um, at the to the table because basically we have some some room there. Is we need to prioritize to get uh, to elevate the, the company the best way, right? Yeah. So to basically say, shouldn't we even um, perhaps pre-hire some positions where they, they actually haven't been in the budget initially to uh, increase uh, speed on certain uh, operational uh, topics in the company yeah. as well? Yeah. This is just sorry coming into my head and, and, and a little bit off topic, I suppose, but we, you know, running a small business, where do you start? You know, like when you set your objectives out for <clears throat> 2025, say we're approaching 2025, where do you start from setting your objectives? Do you start with headcount? Do you start with revenue? Do you start with, and then how does that trickle down into what do we need to, does that make sense? I don't know if I'm explaining yeah. that question very well, but. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> I tried to answer it somehow. <laughs> no, um, I think it, I mean, everything needs to start with the company strategy in the end. This needs to be aligned with uh, 
the investors, shareholders, the yeah. supervisory board, however you are set up. Um, and that's a super important process, right? You need to be aligned on what you want to afford, how much you want to spend, what you expect, in, uh, so to say, in regards to return to it. Yeah. And uh, that that triggers down, so to say, the rest of it, right? So meaning which people you want to hire, uh, in which speed you want to hire them, which profiles, how, mu how much you want to step up actually, right? In terms yeah. of profiles you want to hire, you want to hire medium or very senior people already. There's also a, a possibility to overhire in the sense of this person is too senior. This person yeah. doesn't get the hands dirty anymore. Yeah. So uh, this is what you need to align. And there needs to be, to say, a derived people strategy as well. And that's yeah. simple. That that needs to be honestly written down. Yeah. Ideally. Yeah. So it's a big collaborative process. It, it needs to be. And it's just, we, you know, where you start, you start with, we want, we want, yeah, I suppose that's just depends on the collective of the share shareholders, right? Do you want to focus on revenue? Do you want to focus on profitability? Do you want to focus what those objectives are? And then you build that. Exactly. Yeah. And I guess it also depends if your people person in your business or your most senior people person has a seat at that strategic table, right? Yeah. So I guess if you do have a, a CPO there to, to help build that strategy, um, then that obviously changes how the money is spent on the people, right? Yeah. I guess in a lot of businesses, talent or, or TA don't have a, a seat at that table. They're kind of given their budget, right? As opposed to kind of helping build and shape that budget. So I guess in, in places you've worked in, in the, the immediate example, do you have a people person with you when you are building that strategy at sea level or is it a consideration that it's handed down to them? No, absolutely. Uh, um, yes, we do. Absolutely. So there is, uh, we have a, a chief people officer as well in the company. And uh, yeah, and of course, I mean, she even drives the people strategy there. Uh, so meaning it's a really fully aligned and we even uh, CFO and CPO, so to say, also lock in for 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 uh, making the strategy and making explicit on how, how does yeah. it look like. And we have a few iterations uh, with the management team. Uh, that we are fully aligned on how this should be mapped out over the next uh, one or two years, yeah. And on these iterations, I just always need to say that again. Don't believe that you're yeah. done when you have done your annual budgeting cycle. Yeah. <laughs> That's not going to happen, yeah. So funny, because we've done that before, haven't we, with the rec hub. We set a budget, and then we just track it. You, you know, we know we're off, we know we're either going yeah. well, that way, and you don't do anything about it. Yeah. You know, it needs to be iterated and, and worked on. And, and that sort of maybe brings me to another point, is how often... From a people perspective, do you sit down and look at budgets? So, I mean, not from because you've got two two position two types of conversation there, like budget in terms of the company's headcount yeah. and salaries, and then you've got budget in terms of how much we're spending on acquiring those headcounts. Yeah, and, and as exactly. Or, but where it's diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives, or, or whatever it might be within the people sphere, how often do you a lot like sort of look at that? Uh, look at that budget and sort of iterate it from a TA or a people perspective. Yeah, I look, um, I, I can speak here more broadly about it because I am doing rolling forecasts on a monthly basis. I think that should be, to be honest, uh, everybody's yeah. way of doing it. Yeah. Um, and uh, this topic is part of it. So absolutely, we look yeah. at all aspects of the business. And even if you say, you can also say you understand, basically, and you need to ask yourself, why didn't we uh, to say spend this? possible amount of money you said to get the right hire they spend it well you know most recently that was my reaction <laughs> <laughs> well i could always help i told you that <laughs> you need the odd invoice i know i know <laughs> i know where to go <laughs> yeah fantastic um uh, did you see that by the way yeah. and then there's a few a few months back where uh, a guy just uh, has been was arrested for fraud 120 million and he was just sending rogue invoices to google and Facebook, and they were just paying them. He'd never worked there, mm -hmm. no services. They were just paying these invoices. Wow. No, it's interesting. Yeah. I'm going to start doing that. <laughs> um, all right, interesting. So from, you know, if I'm a head of talent acquisition, it, there's often a feeling within TA that they are, you know, they don't necessarily have full ownership of that budget um, or how they go about in spending it. Do you think that there's not necessarily the fourth line, but as a more of a collective industry standard, do you think there is enough autonomy in how different departments are spending in their budgets? 
Probably not, to be honest. Yeah. I think yeah, if you make the assumption that it's what you just did, right? It's probably not this way. I probably need to agree. But of course, uh, having the autonomy and as I said, you 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 basically predefine yeah. what you want to spend there, and you anyhow iterate on a whatever monthly or quarterly basis and where you stand there. Uh, and as I said, you should also ask yourself if you underspend, did you actually achieve your goals still, right? Yeah. Because there must be a reason, but perhaps why you didn't spend it. And um, so yes, I think there should be certain autonomy um, um, to the to the TA team as well. Yeah. To think about how do I spend it because I think um, as mentioned before with the management team I think the most important target is to align on what has priority what do we need to focus on and give the clear message and alignment with the team um, to say this is what needs to be happen and this is how we believe it should happen yeah but how to make it happen if they say I go external or I can do it myself or whatever that should be up to the uh, to the TA team. Yeah, yeah. and I guess that's why you need that constant reassessment of, of flex of that plan, right? Because I, I guess people and the TA teams, similarly to to the sales teams, um, th there's so many variables. Like you are not in control of the people output, right? In terms of, and I don't mean output as in terms of what they're doing. I mean output in terms of half your team could turn around tomorrow and say, we've got a new job we're leaving. The same as you might not make sales, right? how people act within that people team is out of your control. So that constant flex, I guess, needing that that variable and that reassessment all the time, yeah. I guess that's why autonomy, it needs to be with the people team, right? Because they are in constant flux all the time. They're in, the people who are in charge of their own destinies, right? And as they leave, it it's should be it. Yeah. It's all, it must ultimately be driven driven by revenues, right? So, you know, it depends on, did we... Uh, you know, underachieve or overachieve our revenue targets this month because that could potentially have a knock-on effect to the budget. Yeah, of course. I mean, in the end, revenue and profitability is always are the driving forces for everything, right? Sure. And then you need to break it down on and also, but also to this, right? If you say, well, I mean, uh, we hit all, all our revenue targets, we hit all our profitability targets till you overachieve them, and have the people in place to also further make it happen for the future, but. Uh, perhaps underspend so far or whatever, then you probably don't need to spend the rest of it, right? So I think, or the other way around, right? So I think uh, that that's the constant iteration, of course, yeah. Nice. So uh, in this segment, Peter, we are going to, uh, we ask, and you will do this for us at the end of this podcast, we ask every guest to recall the question for the next guest. This is Mario Herrera okay. from Alt. Soon to be somewhere else, but it's a uh, secret. <laughs> should be the purpose uh, of an HR department? Why Why should you even have one? Wow, no way. You just binned HR. <laughs> what should be the purpose of HR? Do you know what? That's a drastic question. <laughs> drastic question, yeah. So but let me give some context behind that. We feel like, uh, you know, in part of that, that conversation, we were talking um, a lot about how the role of TA people and HR has changed a lot in the last sort of five, five to 10 years. And, and actually, um, HR has used to be the driving force behind, um, nearly all of the topics that fall within people, uh, in, in a business. And, and now that in lots of businesses, not all businesses, HR takes more of the legal compliance, mm. you know, employee relations type topics. Um, but then you sort of have this, you know, this new, it used to be CHRO a lot, and now it's Chief People Officer, um, and HR falls within the people function uh, in some instances rather than the, you know, the people function falling in the HR function, if you like. Um, and we're seeing lots more Chief People Officers come from a talent background, not an yeah. HR background. And so we were discussing how that has changed, and, you know, Mario has some thoughts on, why does HR exist? So he, he said, what should be the role of HR in your view? Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, address a question and I think uh, it's a fair question in the sense that you need to ask always again and again, why do you do certain things, right? Yeah. And I think when it boils down and you just mentioned one thing, uh, the difference between human resource area, right? And and the chief people uh, and the people area, um, in the end, perhaps some HR or people, people, <laughs> well, nice expression, but uh, we're not 
we would like this expression, but in the end, of course, also people are a resource, right? Yes. Business, right? Yes. Without people, you can't deliver anything. Yes. So I think you also need to think it into that. Shape. That. But that's that. <laughs> Without people, you can't deliver anything, said by the CFO. So yeah, I'm spelling you by the other cup. So, so meaning it's also, of course, something that you invest, right? Yeah. And you, you need to invest the best resources that you, you always consider um, what you want to put into the equation. And that means as uh, people are, of course, the most value ever input factor in that sense, you need, you want to manage it properly, right? And of course, uh, you can't ask the uh, people area to manage uh, or be responsible for every aspect of it because I think the management is there to also manage people, yep. but somebody needs to moderate it. Somebody needs to identify the right talents on the market. Somebody needs to think about organizational setup. Somebody needs to think about um, attracting them, right? Yep. To employment to branding. Thing. Yeah, yeah but... employment branding and all these things. So if you can do that, you will struggle a lot yeah, yeah. to also create the output factors of the whole Definitely. equation. I mean, yeah, I hope that people don't feel offended because I, yeah, no, it's so mathematical. But uh, no, I don't such opinions. So, you, in your in your view, HR should still sort of that's the that's the role of HR is is sort of how resources are allocated from a human perspective, quite literally. It's it's part of it. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's part of it. Yeah. Um, I said it's, in, it's interesting that you kicked off the, the you know the conversation with you you start the budgeting process with HR. Um, yeah. and I think that's sort of maybe where we, we've seen different relationships between talent acquisition and talent management and people as a sort of function and, and the relationship with HR, but yeah, budgeting, but also tracking and reforecasting. I think this yeah. is always, I mean, what I like to do there is, uh, also specify specific roles and people and define how they interact, how often they meet, right. To just take just track what they're actually doing and what yeah. uh, and where we're heading together, right? So, uh, for example, uh, the classically uh, HR controller or people controller, whatever, uh, how you were right yeah. right, who takes care of uh, the FTE budget and looks which people we are hiring, etc., and the profiles how we if we over or underspend in that sense, super important. And this, uh, yeah. And to be honest, I actually don't care whether this person is allocated if it's in my area or yeah, somewhere else. Doesn't matter in the end as long as you get the data and yeah, my, yeah, it really yeah. never talks to both of us, yeah. And that that process, that whole process, must become. Does it become easier or harder depending on where or what stage the company is at? So going back to one of your previous roles at Bitpanda, mm -hmm. um, company that went almost overnight went crazy, right? It was I feel like fell through the first unicorn, unicorn, the first Australian unicorn, was it? Yeah, so going through, if I look going through round after round after round, we're constantly growing, and the headcount was exploding at the same time. Like, I'm at one point, a hundred people a month, yeah, yeah. hundred and fifty maybe yeah. or more, yeah, which is close to yeah, which, which is crazy, right? Um, so does that does the process of kind of does that make it easier to manage or harder to manage? Because you know you're going through a huge growth phase, but there's just so many variables month after month because you've got such an intake of people that that must like your budget must it's all over the place, right? It makes it more difficult to sort of plan. So that's that. Keeping pretty, up with that must be crazy. It's keeping up with it is pretty difficult to be honest. Yeah. Uh, I think the smelliness and more controllable is, it means it's also more controllable. Yeah. I think uh, that's definitely true. But the bigger the company, in, in fact, but also the faster you want to grow, of course, it gets more complex. Yeah. So you've got sort of two ends of the, you've got the middle bit's the hardest bit, right? Yeah. yeah. So when you have a startup, easy, less numbers, less yeah. stuff going on. Scale up fucking nuts. No one knows what's going on. It's all just punting figures and get them in and hopefully it'll be okay. And then you've got sort of your know, corporate, which is, you know, it's all a little bit more stable. Even if you're hiring 20,000 a year, yeah. you know, if you're a 100,000 person business, it's it's all relative and it's, you know, it's, there's processes, there's people, there's yeah. much more controlled, I guess. The, the, the word control is quite, absolutely quite right. Quite system that's a crowd. I think um, if you do such, super high fast hiring you need to understand that's probably out of the regular business event right so yeah, yeah, right. understanding needs to be different that means it's not just yeah you hire an ongoing business etc you're doing something extraordinary yeah and it needs to be treated as extraordinary that means however you want to call this person it probably deserves also kind of a project manager yeah it purely focuses on it that it doesn't get out of control that has that tracks the numbers understands where we stand set yeah. priorities 
and has 100% of its time focused on that. And I think that's the main difference that needs to happen there. Yeah. You also handle the situation like an exceptional one. Yeah. yeah. Um, I know this is off topic with the CFR and TA connection, but it's probably worth talking about because Ben is a marketing and branding guru. I mean, guru is probably giving me five hours. Oh, wizard, wizard, whatever, whatever terminology you would take, you take it off. Um, how do you, how do you measure ROI on some of these, on, on some of these things? Is that something that actually comes under your remit? We always talk about this in, in different circumstances. How do you measure the ROI on brand, uh, you know? You've got marketing in terms of sales marketing, which you typically has a more direct line to ROI. We spent this on the event. Did we get anything out of it? You can track it through your CRM. It's easier for me. But in terms of like spending on brand awareness and, and those sort of topics, they're very important for lots of businesses or even improved branding could be sort of tied into that. But yeah, do you, do you, do you, how, is that just something you say, listen, we've got to spend a hundred grand on that. Forget about it. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> Yeah, tracking that, of course, uh, I mean, the more fluffy it gets, of course, the harder it states to track basically. Um, the only thing that I can say is that I have done it several times and I understand the benefits of it, right? Yeah. So I definitely have seen, if you spell on red, you, well, um, and there might be even metrics, for example, how many applications you get in, how many inbound yeah. inbounds you get, right? Yeah, yeah. How, type of quality it is. You can even cluster that if you want. I mean, it's also a question of how, how much appetite you have to I hold on everything, everything you hold. Yeah. Uh, but there are some metrics like it said, how many inbounds you get, uh, where do they come from, uh, what kind of quality, how would you basically sort it uh, to each other. Um, that's an approach to do it, right? And that's something that's probably easier than, than anything else. No, I mean, from an employer branding perspective, that's yeah. got to be the easiest yeah. metric to manage, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, t in any business, right? Any, any activity you do, you, you should be able to justify why you are why you were doing that, right? I, I get some things that are slightly more intangible, but any any investment into a team within a business, I guess, should be treated as an investment. Any investment is right person, you want it to grow, really. Yeah, yeah. So any investment you make in a team or in a budget, you'd expect a returning sum of sense on that on that investment. Um, whether that's that the slightly intangible one of more more bums on seats from an employer brand point of view, but I guess you should yeah, you, uh, uh, track that all back, right? Yeah, if you're just looking at it from a more generic branding perspective, then you should hope to see some form of revenue increase in some sense. Um, yeah, that's a direct line to ROI is the, the glary part. I guess the point would be um, no branding should be generic, right? Like, no, or no activity should be kind of generic. Should, yeah, it should, be, um, it should have a focus so and a your point. Reason, um, your, yeah, that it, a bit, yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's just, it's the same as anything. Like, really true. We're really true. We shouldn't do anything that isn't gonna have a an output or or affect something in some in some way. But I think that to employer branding, there needs to be understood one thing in my belief. You can do a lot of classical employer branding activities, classically marketing things, right? Yep. And then being in advance and and uh, etc. But the other thing is, you also need to live a certain company culture because people. Cool. Well, no, okay. well, most things, right? From previous uh, employees or anything like that. You need to also create a culture. So employer branding is not just being at an event and selling the company there and giving some so or whatever. Yeah. That's just not the point, right? You need to have a, a motivational uh, a vision for the company. You need to have uh, the right cultural setup. You need to do some something internal for the people as well that they stay inspired. And this is a good basis to start in. We should not forget how important it is also for attracting talent. And yeah. Literally, couldn't couldn't agree anymore. Yeah. We're coming right off the side. Ben's, Ben's a culture culture is the culture but, culture. But I think you, you can't an an employer brand framework or even a, a massive all encompassing AV Perry. Yeah. It's it's a framework that people have to embody and live and yeah. buy into because your culture or the ethos of your business isn't generated from a lovely EVP presentation, it's from people buying into that and feeling like they belong and feeling part of something. Yeah. So completely agree. I think that the structure and the the guidelines of employee branding and EVP can be set from the top, but it has to live and grow from the bottom up, right? And then you get that lovely point in the middle where everyone's yeah. happy. Yeah. You know, and it meets and the people embody the, the culture and the culture is the people. Um, so yeah, couldn't, couldn't agree with you more on that point. 
we're moving on swiftly, I think. Segment, just I don't know what segment we're at now, Rosie. Oh, sorry about segments management, but we our segment management manager died. But um, so we're uh, we're looking at sort of alignment and shared goals between budgetary constraints, the CFO and his org or her org or their org. It's too many pronouns these days. Um, and um, and and the the sort of wider talent team. So um, it's an interesting question posed by one of our audience members. How do you measure the success of the TA team's efforts from a financial perspective? And then it, 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 I'll just add some context to that as well, because it depends on the team. Um, we do a little work in some go-to-market teams where the, the TA team, if they are not hitting their targets, are directly impacting the you know, forecasted revenue. Yeah. Because if you don't have BAMs on seats, the the revenue won't be coming in, um, and then obviously there are other teams where if you don't hit bums on seats, there, there might be costs going out. Yeah. It's usually the marketing team that is. Um, but it's just how how do you measure it from a from a finance perspective? Yeah, I think if we want to understand this question, I think you need to basically go back from initial budgeting, right? From the from the from the end result, you have a certain budget. You have already distributed, hopefully distributed the hiring of certain people, you're allocated it to certain periods and you have certain assumptions behind it, like for sales, it's a good example yeah. in that sense. As soon as this person starts, then three months after the person should get tracked, right? And, and should show some results, etc. And that result should deliver revenue at some point. Yeah. So you build up hopefully a, a, a chain of logic, right? That uh, delivers results also to the business. And as soon as you don't deliver that anymore, or you were late with hiring, you see the immediate impact. Yep. So I hope that this plan is so much integrated that you can also track it. That means yeah. you don't hit, so to say, or you don't nail down the certain specific hire at the point, uh, certain point in time, you're going to see the results. So yeah. this is also the basis how you measure it. Mm-hmm. And and you hopefully did that so properly that you also understand what is a reasonable time to hire. That's also something you can track. Yeah. You can hire, uh, and then also measure, of course, uh, uh, later on attrition of people. I mean, how many of the people that you've hired are staying? Yeah, are staying, yeah. in fact, when, and that shows also the quality of it. Right? And I think there are metrics is in that sense that you can also use to, to measure that. For sure. Um, that's really interesting. Do you think, um, try to phrase the question in the right way. We, we talked a little bit earlier where, see, you know, the head of talent acquisition or, or anyone that's responsible for hiring in a business isn't necessarily always involved in that, you know, budgeting process. And when you, you trickle down from, you know, the top, this, these are the business objectives. This is how, these are the, to achieve them, this is how many people we're going to need to hire. Yeah. At that point, do you not think, or is it, is it in, uh, you know, in businesses that I've worked with, it typically isn't, um, but the talent leader should then be you know involved in that discussion because it it also like yeah in order to hire that many people we're going to need this team we're going to need this budget mm-hmm. that's not possible yeah and therefore that's ultimately going to impact longer term of course the results of the business right do you, do you think in too often that 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 person is not involved are they um i'm pretty sure that this is a quite common mistake to yeah was <laughs> And uh, yeah, it's like totally true. I think it's the feasibility check, at least feasibility yes. check. Yes, yes, yes. And there, just yeah, look at it because I mean, even if you have certain targets and you say, yeah, it should be able to, uh, that, that's enough time uh, to hire. But in the end, does the does the TA lead actually have the people in place? Yeah. Does he have, so to say, already linked up externals perhaps in place? Yeah. That can support for that. Um, or is that to be considered? Or even if you look at the profiles that you want to hire there, uh, like possible. I don't know. Right there, yeah. In the markets, for example, I, mean, exactly. you say you, I only want to serve two locations of the company and I want to get them there. I don't uh, allow any remote ones. Yeah, I mean, that's also an answer. That's more goes in more than the quantitative zone, right? Absolutely. And and this is also something that uh, this person can and should challenge, right? For sure. Um, and that makes the budget, the forecast, whatever you do, much more credible. And I think, uh, yeah, uh, this is what needs to happen, yeah? I mean, not saying that it always happens, but uh, should be. It's going to, from now on, anyone that listens to this, <laughs> it's going to happen. 
Um, good. Um, and how do you think the relationship between CFO and the CA team could be improved? You've got two relationships, right? Yeah. You've got the relationship of the budget and the relationship of hiring for your team. That's so true. I suppose they're, they're two different conversations. I don't know if they're two different people, but you know, if, if the head of TA goes nuts and spends loads on agencies or uh, embedded, which is acceptable, um, then you know how how do those, how do those relationships uh, you know work? Yeah, I mean. Pragmatically, um, what, what I'm doing uh, on a normal basis is that I have at least uh, on a monthly basis, uh, 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 yeah, a one-on-one -on -one with the head of TA oh, okay, cool. in a line on basically what the priorities are, what he's hiring for. But also, of course, I also try to cover my my needs as well. Yeah. But in the end, I mean, my role is to take care about the return on investment of the company, right? If we uh, manage it well, this person is a key key lever uh, to make that happen. And this is what we also then discuss, right? To understand, do we meet the targets there? Where are we behind, et cetera? Um, mm. that, that's what we want to do with, together. And that this is what we try to settle down with. But as I said, I think personal movement, personal discussions will be needed to also, uh, yeah, get get aligned on a mental level on what yeah. the priorities need to be. And that's the, the, you know, the perfect and the ideal scenario. What do you think the biggest challenge you face is with a T18? Not necessarily free for one. We don't want to, yeah, we don't want to throw it on a bus. <laughs> um, but just as a typical relationship, what do you think the biggest challenge you face is with, with a T18? I think in general, the always the possible, possibly the biggest problem is always uh, on getting alignment on what our the exact profiles that I'm looking for as a company, what are the right ones? No, what, which, yeah, what yeah. profiles do we need? And to be honest, even the business is sometimes not, and me, my, myself as well, uh, needs to learn on the way, right? You yeah, need yeah. to understand, okay, yeah, my first assumption was that I need this type of profile, it covers this and that aspect, but on the way, you probably learn, and this is why this iteration needs to happen, and also this talk needs to happen. Um, and I've... And also in the phase of that, I've screened first people, right? Mm -hmm. I'm just putting myself now in the in the business uh, uh, position. I need to understand. Wow, I mean, first discussions or first interviews actually revealed, yeah, good discussions. But actually, <laughs> <laughs> right now, I think it would be good to really go this direction, right? Mm -hmm. more senior one or whatever. And uh, um, this is so important, and this is where I think uh, most of inefficiencies are happening. That they are mm -hmm. looking for something different. So just an absolutely misalignment on what, yeah. what the business I think that is. happens quite often. I mean, yeah. it's insane. A lot of these challenges kind of we speak about when we spoke to different people on the, on the podcast is a lot of it does boil down to just more consistent and concise communication, yeah. right? Like have, making sure those, those silos aren't in place and making sure the lines of communication are there yeah. and you're not too rigid on the strategy that you can flex and change even if you're talking about profiles like after your first round of interviews, let's change it, let's tweak this. So they constant like test and learn iteration of, of the strategy and, and the needs, right? Just, just imagine the following, right? I think if you, how important getting the right talents in time, the right profiles and with the right level of investment it is to the company. I mean, you can lose or win on so many fronts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If the, if the recruiter or the the, the talent uh, uh, acquisition person is, so to say, running after say, after something that is actually not the right thing that they actually expected by the business, yeah, mm. then he's wasting his time. Second, uh, if you get the wrong person, yeah, then it hurts the company in the long term. Yeah, yeah and that's so true. Mm. Yeah, and 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 this is why it's so important to get a line on, on all all the angles, right? And uh, yeah, well, bad 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 hires, bad people. Um, can ruin an entire team, you know, yes. an entire yes. department. Uh, so it's it's absolutely that leads me to a topic or a conversation that floats around sometimes, which is should there be a chief talent officer at the build? And that that is not like a loaded question in, yeah. in LA, you know, because obviously we're talking about the importance of, and you're you're talking you're sitting there talking about the importance of talent and yeah. the availability of the best talent and the alignment of the right talent. And how essentially the business can can be made or broken based on yeah. talent, um, and potentially should there be someone at the board 
Yeah, in the office of in in so to say in the modern way of working, there are a lot of chief chiefs. That's very yes. true. So said that. Yeah. Yeah. There's so many chiefs. What was this? I interact with chiefs that are Indian. Was working up. <laughs> no, that's a chief. What about thinking outcasts? Apparently. Fair. So, well, I think um, in the end, it needs to be taken also by the chief people officer. To be honest, right? I think. Uh, yeah, totally. Um, this person needs to cover a lot of things in parallel, right? I think, of, co- of course, there can be some such a person, specifically when it, so to say, becomes that important. If you do, so to say, yeah, h- high pace uh, uh, um, hiring, you can perhaps dedicate a person to that. Yeah. But I think for running a stated business, I think you need to also keep the management team not too broad in that sense. Yeah, right? that makes sense. And that's, it's a tricky, it's a tricky question in that sense. But I think it needs to be leveled out over what I call it. Which isn't he like, yeah, you've got talent and people, HR, who, who's... But to whom does then the ch- uh, chief talent officer report them? They don't. They just do their own thing. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. We them, I yeah. I, yeah, I have no idea. I, I would imagine uh, CEO, um, I'd like everyone else at the boob lover, maybe. Uh, you're talking about it from a, a, a real TA perspective. Yeah, that's interesting. Position, because then arguably just as important would be the the TA or the T keep, keep I know, what's the word I'm looking for? You've got like, talent attraction is one thing, talent attention, take attention, you cheat, you know, they're in, you know, so. Because part of, um, this is probably where the conversation comes from, part of attraction or acquisition, talent acquisition is attraction. Yeah. And it is engagement because if we have, if, if you have an incredibly high uh, attrition rate, yeah, um and then you need to hire more people yeah so if we can if we can impact our attrition rate and keep more good quality people yeah well then we need to hire less people mm-hmm. so that directly impacts the acquisition um so you've got and then obviously you've got talent management which is more like you know learning and development and upskilling and succession planning all of these topics that typically fall within uh, a people's sphere directly impact uh you know the the talent talent as a whole yeah whether that's acquisition uh, you know engagement um management whatever uh, but none of that that always seems to be completely separate from hr as a topic hr is is you know employee relations compliance about violence yeah. it's contracts it's legal in the old world yeah i would say so yeah exactly yeah. um and so that that's probably where this conversation the chief talent officer and chief hr officer or maybe they are both the chief people officer but it's just been a, a conversation that sort of. Uh... I totally get it, but in the end, I think um, those things interplay, right? Is that they're retained to look at everything. Absolutely. So I think it, in the end, it should be covered. I mean, mm-hmm. can call it chief people officer or in, in, in any kind, but I think uh, it's all under that. It should, it should come from that. But as I said, I think if you do high pace hiring or uh, do a different thing that setup, then perhaps this might be justified to elevate it. But That's I think good. for a lower term constant development, I think it. Should keep be under it narrow. Yeah, keep the alignment the yeah. same. Yeah, good. Well, it kind of takes us full circle. But you've got that strategy, and you're aligned on that strategy. Yeah. Then the deployment of that, whether it's acquiring people or keeping people, is it's all under yeah. the people. Yeah, it's all under loads that. of chiefs. Yeah. So <laughs> that, <laughs> um, and uh, I think that's that's everything from the the CFO. I don't know. What do you think, Ben? Have we have we covered most topics that have come up in our podcasts. I, I think so. Um, I think it's really interesting to hear. The always hear the interaction between talent teams and, and finance teams. As I said, we had Amar on a little while ago on, on Series 1. Yeah. Good friend of mine who's gone from a finance role to a CEO role. So it was interesting to hear his, his journey and kind of his interaction with people. And the same, the same with you, Peter. You've kind of, for your for your roles, have been able to interact with TA teams. And I guess the positives of that is always, always good to hear. And for you, Peter, you've gone from, you've gone from strategy operations cfo ceo the next role for you <laughs> to be honest i'm quite happy with the c4 role i think yep. it's a very interesting one because uh you have you can be very very impactful yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh i like the idea of what the c4 role basically entails it's so to say uh cover all the success factors you have to monitor it you have to track it you have to suggest it I think it shouldn't be underestimated in, so to say, also in the new world of uh, how we should think about it, how 
the CFO helps and, and which levers uh, the CFO sh should have in hand. For sure. I, I, to be honest, I like that role. <laughs> yeah, I like it a lot. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that's good. Good. So hopefully we've covered all of the questions and queries that have come up uh, in, in relation to the, the CFO and the TA connection from, from previous episodes. Thank you, Peter, for, for being a guest on the, the Power Marketing Writing Podcast. Um, we, and thank you, Ben, for joining us once again. Very welcome. Um, and that's it from us. Join us next time.